Today, we're going one-on-one with a three-time Olympian speed skater who turned passion and an ice-cold determination into gold medal glory. That's coming up next. Hi, and welcome to the Living Richly Podcast. My name is Eric Desha. I'm here with my very dear friend, Rob Dale, and we're so excited about today's show. We have three-time Olympian Olivier Jean. Uh, he's a speed skater. He won gold in the Vancouver 2010 uh, Olympic Games in the men's 5,000-meter relay, uh, he, and he's well-known, apparently, for, at the time, dreadlocks and listening to reggae music, which apparently made him faster. It is so great to have you here today, Olivier. Thanks for having me, guys. This is exciting for me. We are we're so thrilled to have you here because uh, be, you know making it to the Olympic Games uh, is a feat in and of itself. Making it there three times, representing Canada, winning the gold. Uh, when I first heard your story, I had, uh, had the opportunity. You were speaking at a corporate event where we were both presenting, uh, but you were presenting in the morning, and I loved uh, the 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 title of his talk was "Wisdom from a Lifetime." of left turns in spandex. He got my attention (laughs) right out of the gate uh, with that. And you shared your story so brilliantly about getting clear about what you want out of life and going after it. And that's what we're really looking forward uh, to diving into today. So first question, let's start at the very beginning. Uh, When did you first realize you had a passion for speed skating and what about it spoke to you so deeply? So, uh, you know, like, when you watch short track speed skating on TV, there's lots of uh, exciting stuff happening. There's lots of crash shit. But when you're living it, it's uh, a way more action sport that it can see on TV. You know, those tight corner, there's lots of bumping. And it's also when you're a kid, it's a very social sport because we're, we're like 20 on the ice in the middle of a short uh, a hockey ice size ring. So we're always chit chatting and uh, making jokes so it was that social aspect mixed with that the extreme sport a uh, little bit of uh, action driven that I, I really enjoyed and I got thrown in the sport at five years old and never really uh, rethinked about it and just stayed involved wow so, so you and you mentioned there's 20 of you or, or more in this community that are all kind of hanging out there and and uh enjoying this uh not all 20 become olympians uh <laughs> so what was it in those at what point in in life at those early days where you said hey i can actually really i'm good at this and i might make something of this so i kind of you know when you grew up in a, an amateur sport, the top or like the, the best you can do is go at the Olympic game. So ever since I was five years old in the sport, it was always something that like my parents would talk about, my grandparents, uncle, friends, you know, teacher at school. So it, you always think about it because that kind of the, the best thing you could do or you could achieve. And I was always successful growing up in the sport. But it's really, uh, I'd say, when I, I, I hit high school and I went to sports school where uh, I shifted and I, I became a little bit more serious about it. Now, I got I to gotta ask this question because um, uh, I think of, you mentioned about doing this on a, on a hockey uh, rink. I think of uh, five-year-olds on a, when, they're, when they start playing hockey, you know, the little Timbits uh, and the way that they are all falling around and everybody's trying. I can just imagine, what's it like at five years old? What does it look like to be a speed skater at five years old? <laughs> Uh, it's you know, it's a uh, uh, very disorganized, <laughs> lots of crash shit and uh, lots of crying. <laughs> uh, and you know, you start uh, when you're involved on the ice with uh, those kids. Uh, it's uh, just learn to skate, and uh, you have uh, hockey skates. So lots of that uh, in speed skating club. It learn to skate, and uh, as kids learn to skate, they can either choose to do short track, stay involved in the short track. Or go play hockey or do figure skating. So it's kind of a little bit of the development stage for younger kids just to uh, learn how to skate. 
I, I love that. A lot of crashes and a lot of crying. It sounds like, it sounds like most life. adults, right? <laughs> it sounds like the story never really changes much, right? Uh, but again, it, it takes such commitment uh, to make it to the Olympic Games to get to, I mean, and you competed internationally for years uh, and were very successful. Uh, can you describe for us a, a pivotal moment where you really had to work through some hardship, make some sacrifices, make some tough decisions to help you get there? So I guess uh, where like my career really uh, changed direction is uh, when I, I stopped, uh, when I became a senior athlete. So a, as a junior, you're always competing in age category. And I was very successful from a young age. But my success mainly came because I was a lot bigger and more developed than all the other kids my age. And uh, when I started to uh, to race as a senior athlete uh, against other adults, or yeah, adult actually, then like that physical advantage uh, was not showing at all. And what I, I could, we could really see analyzing my skate is like my technique was totally shit. <laughs> So I kind of always use my physical, my physical strength to win as a kid, but that physical strength disappear as a senior, and then I, I needed to spend a good like four or five years of bad result when I transitioned from seventeen years old to twenty two years old, and that was uh, lots of lots of commitment on uh, getting more flexible, uh, getting into the right angles, changing my technique. And not really getting support also because uh, financial support from the federation because I was not yet successful having uh, going to school full time, having to work, having to train. So that was a uh, kind of very, very um, hard four or five years, uh, I'd say. I, I would imagine. And, you know, it's uh, it's incredible to me. You describe, you know, uh, 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 your strength and your size. Uh, in the early stages uh, were key to your success. And then all of a sudden you find yourself competing at another level and that's no longer working for you. We call that, you know, what got you here won't get you there. Uh, And all of a sudden you spend the next four to five years in many ways relearning the sport, learning new techniques, learning new, like taking your game to the next level. The vast majority of people, when they find themselves in that type of situation, kind of tend to throw in the towel or just coast, but for you, you kept going. What were the beliefs that you had or the commitments you made to yourself that that helped you through that that season? So I, I could have a very fancy answer, but the real thing is that I, and, and still today, I don't, I don't see anything else that's more fun than uh, being on the ice turning left and going fast. So I just <laughs> kept going for it because I, I didn't know if I could find anything else outside of the ice ring that would bring as much fun and, and excitement. So I wanted to really try to extend and keep going and keep going. And I got all of your friends and I was surrounded by a very good group of friends and uh, skating. So I, I just stayed involved with it. Uh, and I... Yeah, I, I push. I push through those uh, couple art of art season, and uh, I, the first time I made senior uh, national team and race World Cup, I had a fantastic uh, rookie year, uh, winning medal almost every races uh, at international level. So yeah, just uh, mainly following the fun, and uh, didn't really want to get into corporate or a real job at, at that time. I guess I still don't want to do that. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> You, 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 and me both. But, uh, I, that but I love that. I love that. Uh, you, you found something you loved. I love following yeah. the fun. There's a phrase, there, right? Yeah. Uh, and you were surrounded by people that both supported your journey and enjoyed it as well. And and so, what a great winning combination. Uh, I, I think that's incredible for sure. And it's interesting. We we often talk about I mean, that's part of the whole living richly message is this idea of, of follow again, the fun, follow the fun, <laughs> follow the passion, follow what matters to you. Now, I imagine for you, there probably were some significant moments uh, where it really kind of uh, the challenges, whatever that is, that caused you to make the shift uh, in your life to be more dedicated and focused on this. You want to talk a little bit about some of those uh, those significant moments for you? So I'd say like definitely uh, when, I, when I look back at, at my career, when I, I decided uh, with my parents to go to the sports school uh, when I hit high school, so uh, I'd go... Uh, train full time, uh, go to school only uh, or, uh, from 8 to 12, have lunch and train full time. So that was a decision where, okay, we're taking this more seriously. 
It's not for not only for fun anymore. We're gonna train full time and go to a sports school. So that kind of was the first moment where I was like, okay, like that thing is getting serious. After that, uh, when I, I started to get crushed, because I was very successful through all high school. I was successful internationally as a junior. As a senior, I got crushed. Uh, yeah, four years in a row. While other of my other teammates from Canada started to win international senior races, I was still getting crushed in Canada. We're the same age category. So I, I was really uh, working out, trying to catch up to them. So that was a, a second, uh, yeah, second situation in my career. It was uh, challenging and I really had to rethink my mindset. And at that point, like in high school, I took the sport seriously. And when I became senior, I was like, okay, it's not about working hard. It's about training smart. Mm-hmm. And then I, I went through a, a major injury. When I was uh, 22 years old, I cut myself. I missed a full season on the ice. And wow. uh, yeah. coming back from that injury, I rechanged my mindset with training. And uh, I, I kind of worked a little bit more on the, the mental part of it. Uh, with uh, And uh, I went through... Uh, how to uh, uh, better set goals and achieve those goals and have a more systematic approach about setting goals in my daily life and also on the ice. I think that that third phase of my career really skyrocketed me into a better success. It's amazing. We talk so much about the importance of uh, your mindset, right? Uh, uh, that we we can either wait for life to give us the right type of circumstances or we can go about creating the life that we want. And a big part of that is our mindset. You talked about the shift that happened in your mindset, the shift that happened in the way you set goals. I know when you spoke about this at the event that we were both at recently, I was so deeply impressed by it. Can you share with us, gives our listeners some insight. What were those changes of mindset? What were they like? And how did you go about changing the way you set goals? So actually, like, I was young, I had goals, and it's kind of like, I always wanted to go to the Olympic game, wanted to be an Olympic champion. You have some goals, you sit down with your coach, he's like, your shoulder are crooked, you need to have flat shoulder, that's my goal, I'm going to have flat shoulder. You're not lifting uh, enough weight, you got to get stronger, that's my goal. So, like, setting goal was always there, and it's kind of easy, and we kind of all we're all able to set goals and everyone can do it in their own way. But what really changed with my mindset is making sure I remember those goals when the situation got hard. So uh, if I like, so uh, uh, eight years before the Olympic game, I put on top of my bed in my room, giant Olympic ring. So every morning I would wake up and know what my dream is and why Mm. I'm waking up. And every day I would go to bed, I would see those rings and remember what is what I'm going to be dreaming about. So it was about keeping that dream alive, that going to the Olympic game and making it real every day. Uh, four or five years before the Olympic game, I did a, a photo montage where I put myself on top of the Olympic podium in front of Vancouver Olympic ring. So every day I had my training book yeah. and that picture on my training book and I had that picture in the background of my laptop so I would see myself literally see myself on top of the podium at the Olympic game so that wow. really made my dream real so I used different strategy like that to make sure I would remember that dream so I, you can set goal you can have dream but if you forget them when things go sideways then they become useless so it's strategies like that that I use to make sure keep those dreams alive, you know. And I do the same thing in training. So I, I need to keep my shoulder flat. I need to extend my left uh, till the end in the corner. I would have my training book by the boards and write down how many times did I think about it. I did 20 laps. Those were 40 corners. That was 40 opportunity to think about my shoulder. I only did it 20 times. That's 50% of the time. That sucks. It <laughs> needs to be 80% of the time or you're not going to improve. Right. You know what? Like it's it, it's all a neuroplasticity. You're trying to create a new habit. More you think about it, 
better chances you have to 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 change and create change. So I would force myself to remember my daily training objective and always use strategy to keep my dream alive. That long term dream. And that that really so came, um, yeah. That that more systematic approach came with uh, a year of the ice being injured, where I I got a little bit smarter with mental work. I grew up, I was like, let's let's go hard and skate fast, <laughs> right. and uh, I I don't need to work anything mentally. I'm yeah. just gonna muscle it out. Yeah, we talk about the difference between again. Most of us spend our lives trying to hustle or muscle our way through lives, but uh, there's a, a great book called Atomic Habits, and I'm, the author's name is going to escape me right now. But in it, he talks about most of us don't rise to the level of our goals; we fall to the level of our systems. Uh, and I remember when I heard you tell the story about how you know the visualization and daily looking at your dream and reminding yourself and the and the systems that you put in place to keep your dream alive i said see that that's where it is that's the discipline that's the day-to-day effort required to go after something is create a system that makes it really hard to stray mm. right. yeah it's so good I, you know ben uh ben bergeron uh is an uh, he's a coach and an author he's the author of the book chasing excellence uh, i'm not sure if you're familiar with him but ben bergeron is a a, a crossfit coach and he has coached uh, david's uh uh Catherine david's daughter and some of the other athletes who have won the world's fittest athlete uh at the crossfit games and in his book chasing excellence he starts out at the near the beginning of the book he says he said uh you know people ask me all the time would i rather have a um an athlete who is uh uh, got all the talent in the world mm. or has the right mindset and his his answer he goes i'm going to surprise people he says i would rather have a, the athlete with the talent because i can teach and train mindset i can get them to change <laughs> right. their mindset he said at the end of the day when you get to the elite level like you're at as an as an olympian uh you're talking tenths of seconds uh between being on the podium and being off the talent that everybody has is the same it's the mindset that you approach talk i want to just get you to lean in because it's such a it's such a big part of what we talk about all through this podcast in day-to-day life not just for the olympian who's trying to get on the platform but just how you live your life each day so much of your success is going to come back to the mindset that you bring into that maybe just again how much has mindset affected your your success so uh so uh, being an athlete is a 24-7 job. Yeah. And uh, the problem with a 24-hour, seven days a week job is you can go mentally crazy really fast because <laughs> everything you do can have an impact. Mm. Should I sleep one more hour? Should I eat a little bit less? <laughs> right, Should right. I stretch a little bit more? Who's doing what? You know, is is the Chinese team doing a little bit more weight than me? So you can really... Uh, Make yourself go crazy, and I, I, I was always borderline, maybe <laughs> even too much, maybe not. So uh, I, I had very systematic approach, and I, I'm data driven. I like, I like my data. You know, I, I write everything down. And when power meter came out on the bike, I had my power meter. You know, like the in the gym, looking how fast you move, all that. I, I love that stuff. So uh, I was always a little bit borderline with that, and I think how. I, I was able to keep uh, the the approach LD is a, a, a very social person. I always stayed involved in school. I did my kinesiology degree as I was training. I never skipped a, a semester of school all the way during my career. I was always involved. So it really gave me, it forced me to have a, a good life balance. And I think as uh, other athletes I was involved with thought that maybe going to school, uh, took a little bit recovery time off, I thought it, it gave me a great mental balance. Mm. So for, for me, it was more about that that mental balance to not uh, go overboard and too crazy with uh, with training. Uh, I love that you told the story again at the uh, event that we shared together um, about trying to bring ideas to the team uh, and to the coaches. And that at first was not well received, but turned out to then become a winning uh, strategy. Can you tell that, tell us that story in, in maybe two to three minutes? Tell us th- that story at the high, the high points. Yeah. So, uh, uh, in short track speed skating, there's a team event. It's a relay. It's for, for the men. It's 5,000 meters. It's uh, 45 laps. 
And uh, in, uh, in 1991, just before 1992 Olympic game, the Canadian team decided that the best strategy was for each athlete to skate a lap and a half and exchange to the next one and skate a lap and a half and exchange to the next one. And uh, for, for 20 years, that's been the winning strategy. And every single team on the ice was using exactly that same strategy. And uh, as a, a development athlete, I was a little bit younger in 2006, leading for Tokyo Olympic game. Uh, I was looking at that and thinking about it and kind of chit-chatting with friends involved with football, soccer, and hockey. And uh, they thought it was so funny that every single team would use the same strategy. Uh, it made no sense for someone coming out of a team sport. But we're an individual sport doing a team event. And I looked at everyone race and I, I thought we would gain an advantage in Canada if we would use the strength and weaknesses of each of our athletes and use a different strategy to increase our chance of winning in the you know, Olympic game. I was not on the team. <laughs> I, I was a, a younger athlete. I was not qualified. I went to the head coach and I was like, I've got a fantastic idea. We <laughs> should change. We should change the exchange. We should change. I love that. <laughs> We're going to do something totally new. Yeah. And they, they were like, no way we're going to listen to you. You right. know, like, I, I don't know if they thought about it or what happened in the, the background, but it was uh, it was refused. And then uh, uh, fast forward four years later, before the Olympic game in Vancouver, I had my spot on the team. Uh, I was successful on the team. I was a senior athlete. I was getting ready two years before the Olympic game. I came back with that idea. We had a new coach. We had a new uh, sport director. And uh, we we gave a little bit more thought to it. I showed some data, some ideas. And I was able to change the strategy. And uh, we secretly work on a new strategy that uh, we call the Cobra Operation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we the day before the final at the Olympic game, where all the other team were watching us on the ice training, we got the security to empty the stand so no other team could see what we were doing. Everyone got pissed off. <laughs> uh, we take people out. It's usually all the other team are recording and watching you. We got people out of the the uh, the arena. It was a great. It was great. We're like that. Where it uh, we have more chance of winning because they're pissed off than being able to spy on us. And then uh, we uh, we executed that new strategy only at the Olympic final in Vancouver and give us a winning edge. Yeah, it was uh, phenomenal. You think again of the uh, the willingness to just when you you have a dream or you have an idea, you have something you want to bring to the table. And again, the vast majority of people, uh, you know, there's a there's a saying, I think it's Henry David Thoreau who said most men go to the grave with the song still in them. I think a lot of folks never even bring what's inside of them to life. But even for those that find the courage to do that, to be shut down, only to then find the courage to bring it again and then uh, win gold as a result of that Cobra strategy, Cobra operation. I mean, that must have been very satisfying for you. No, uh, yeah, yeah, it was great, and it was uh, it was great from a, like the whole team and the feeling on the team where like we're doing something special, we're having an edge, and our coach is saying yes. And if we lose because of that, he's gonna lose his job yeah. and look stupid that he said yes to something new. And the, the sport director, so it was all all of the organization saying yes, and the other athlete, and it just I like. Maybe we could have won without doing a different strategy, but it just made us feel like we had something special and we were were going to win for sure. It was just a yeah, great feeling going to the line and on, on the ice at the Olympic game. What an what an incredible example of leadership from that coach to be willing to put his own career uh, at risk in order to engage uh, and support the idea that is brought from one of the teammates. Uh, my guess is there's been all kinds of lessons that you have learned throughout your uh, Olympic experiences. Are s some of the lessons that maybe you've learned that you've been able to transfer into life outside of speed skating? What would some of those uh, lessons be that you're kind of taking into all of life? So, uh, so since I retired, you, know, you retired from sport and uh, you're a next athlete and yeah, you develop lots of skill being an athlete, but you don't have like corporate skill or you don't have anything else to put on your resume than 
I look good in spandex and I turn left. <laughs> you know, so like, <laughs> I don't know if that that makes you good for a job or not. So uh, it kind of gets easy to compare yourself to other people that like, oh, they're the same age as me. Where are they in their life? And that's something that's also really easy to do when you're training. You know, you get on the ice, you're a 10, 15, 20 athlete, and you keep comparing yourself. Like, how did that guy was doing on the ice? How fast was he going? How fast was I was uh, was I going? So uh, I, I grew up being very, very competitive in that way and always comparing myself. And uh, when I got my, my cut and my injury on my leg, I came back on the ice. Uh, I couldn't follow the junior athlete. I couldn't follow the, the ladies. I, I couldn't follow anyone. It was a year of the ice. So uh, we really worked on, instead of focusing on... Uh, on uh, comparing yourself on other people's level, we're going to focus on your own improvement and see where are you today, how much did you improve compared to yesterday, and how much investment did you do uh, toward your goal. So uh, if you're thinking about your shoulder, if you're doing squat, so be happy with all those small improvements toward your goal, toward your long-term dream, mm. instead of comparing yourself to people around you. And I did that on the ice and became a lot happier with every single training. Because comparing myself, I would come off the ice and be like, someone was faster than me, yeah. someone did this, someone did that. But maybe I still did a great training, but I couldn't see it comparing myself. So being happy with my, my own improvement, and that's something I, I I did and I still do coming out of sport. And uh, sometimes, like, yeah, I'm almost 40 years old and no experience. And someone else got a great house or 20 years of experience in their job and in their field. So it's more the, the path I'm taking and how I'm, I'm improving personally that makes me happy than comparing myself. Absolutely. I mean, if uh, when we compare ourselves to others, that is a formula for misery, right? Uh, uh, it robs you, as you were saying, even though you're performing better, even though you're growing, even though you're evolving, uh, you lo- there's always, in your world, a faster skater. There's always a bigger fish. There's always someone who's at a different place in their path. And when we compare ourselves, it, it just steals the joy uh, out of our journey. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm curious, uh, uh, our show, Living Richly, is all about people getting very deliberate about figuring out what their best life looks like and then going after it, right? Uh, a lot of people are just going through life uh, sort of like in a coma, uh, right? Uh, they're passing the time, not making the time count. You've clearly uh, been on a journey of uh, eye on the pr- eyes on the prize and working through adversity and discipline and building your mindset and all the physical challenges you had to go through. But uh, how would you answer the question, what does it mean for you to live your best life? So uh, it was kind of, uh, it's crazy because I, I was thrown into the sport, but I feel like uh, I never really had a bus and I never really had a work and I ne- also never took any vacation because and I don't feel like I need to take vacation and I never felt like I needed to take a break or a vacation because every day I wake up and I'm doing what I like. So that's a little bit, little bit how I felt. And when you're an athlete, uh, you're always in control. So you have the final say on what you're doing. So uh, it's I know it's harder. I, I know and I, I'm still living it right now. It's harder to do when you come out of sport. But I, I'm now trying to find strategy where I feel more uh, more in control of my own decision and the direction that I go. Because inside sport, it was really, really easy. And also you have kind of a, a support team all pushing in the same direction. And uh, that's what I'm currently trying to navigate in the the, the, the normal life, uh, I would say, how to, to feel in control of the decision, even if I, I need to uh, do something for someone else or write email that I don't want to write, seeing a little bit of the, the bigger picture and how it, it's going to connect with the long-term, uh, long-term dreams or long-term goals. And... Uh, yeah, it's it was easier to do in sport because it, it's very clear path. Be on top of the podium. 
And uh, in the, the real life, uh, since I, I, I retire, it's a little bit harder to do, but uh, I kind of try to use that, that same strategy. And uh, when I, I do something that I'll really feel like doing, remembering long term what it's going to bring and what are those, those investments. So, uh, Really good. No, I really good. Yeah. I, I loved. I loved how you uh, you <laughs> you responded to the question when we sent it to you ahead of time, just preparing for the show. You summed it up as have fun, no boss, no rules, no work, no vacation. And I thought, That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, what a lot of our listeners. We we often will hear listeners will send us. Uh, we'll get emails or comments about some of the uh, episodes. And one of the most common themes that we hear from uh, people is they're struggling either to find their passion, their own passion, uh, or they're struggling to stick to it. They some you know setbacks come, issues come, and everything, and they and they they don't know how in the middle of challenges to stick with their passion. Uh, what advice would you give if you're talking to somebody and they say to you, uh, "How do how do I find my passion? How do I commit to it or stick to it?" What would you say to them? Uh, I'm. It, it was easy for me in side sport, and I never had that really that that question uh, because I grew up with it. And uh, to be totally honest, I'm still kind of trying to see what would be right now, kind of that that passion and that long term objective. Uh, I I'd say for since I came out of competitive sport, it's been a it's been a challenge. I don't know if I'm the greatest guy to give advice right now because I'm still in the still in the middle of it after four years of retirement. So I'm I I still love doing sport and I'm not really involved now in sport for competition, but more for long term health and makes me feel really really good every time I do sport to uh, feel like I'm investing in myself. And uh, it's just deep down makes me feel good. Uh, yeah, it's a tricky question for uh, me to answer I, right now. I, I love the I, lo- I actually, I love the answer. And yeah. I'm going to actually use the answer. Next time somebody says to me, I'm really struggling to find my passion. I'm going to say, then you're just like an Olympian. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, right because and it just it's it and what that does is it it for people it normalizes it's it's okay we often talk here uh, 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 with living richly about the notion of having compassion uh, for yourself uh, being you know and and so when somebody is struggling to find their 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 passion mm. to struggling to find uh, what it is that's going to drive them I the first thing to do is is it's okay to be struggling with that it's okay to not know uh, it's not not okay to stay not knowing, but it's okay to not know. Don't be hard on yourself because you don't have that answer. Instead, do is just as what you're doing, which is to start taking the steps to finding what that is now. In your case, life after the Olympics, life after professional or, or uh, uh, amateur uh, sport. Uh, where do you go and what do you do next? But what I, I love the answer because it normalizes it for people. Yeah, I mean, most people wouldn't expect an Olympian to be honest uh, on that particular front, right? <laughs> Like, uh, uh, and this, uh, uh, the, the, anyone who's achieved tremendous success early on in life, I think goes through this challenging now journey of when that chapter of their life is over is now, now, now what, what's next. Right. Uh, uh and you've talked about a few of the things you're involved in, but what is next for you as you look forward to the future? I know you're still figuring some things out in terms of where you're going, but what are the things that you're currently involved in that you want our listeners to know about? So uh, I'm, uh, I, I have the, oppor- like, I'm still very passionate about uh, speed skating. I have the, I had the opportunity to uh, get on the national team uh, coaching staff. I'm tactical coach right now for Speed Skating Canada. So uh, I'm very happy to, uh, to be sharing my 30 years plus of experience of uh, turning fast and uh, uh, turning fast left uh, with the younger generation. And uh, right now, uh, trying to get them to achieve their full potential toward the next Olympic game. So I'm very still involved with the uh, with speed skating, and uh, we'll see uh, what's gonna happen uh, after that, and uh, how I can uh, keep growing after, or try to. Uh, pro- I'll probably at some point come out of uh, the speed skating world, but right now I'm focused on the using my knowledge and my experience, try to get the younger kids to reach their full potential and have success at the next Olympic Games. 
Well, speaking of investing in uh, in youth and young people, uh, if uh, if you were to give advice, a, a young person came to you uh, with a dream, and maybe it's speed skating, maybe it's something completely different, but they came to you with their dream and said, "Listen, I've admired you on the ice and off the ice. Uh, what advice would you have for me in order to achieve my dream?" Final words of advice to them. What would you say to them? So I've talked about it earlier and had such a big impact in my career. It, you need to remember that dream. If deep down this is the dream, make sure you remember it. It's easy to have a dream. It's easy to think about that dream. It's smooth sailing. You're 16 years old. You're successful until you're 20 years old. At 20 years old, maybe you're going to run into a huge hurdle and start to doubt yourself. You need to remember that dream and make that dream real and use a systematic approach to not forget it because it's really, really easy to get disappointed and forget about those long-term th- long dreams. Like we're talking about like, I wanted to go to the Olympic game at five years old. I did at 24 years old. <laughs> so years. I know there's lots of stuff happening during those 20 years, like a- as you grow as a person and as you grow as an athlete. So for me, definitely... Uh, if I would have had that mindset when I was younger, I think maybe I would have been more successful early, earlier on in my career. Uh, and uh, for anyone young, uh, dream dream big for sure and make sure that dream stays alive and remember it. We hear so many people say like, oh, I had that dream. I had that dream. Yeah. Why? How did you forget about it? And why oh, did you forget good. about it? That's you good. know, it's still on back of my head but i kind of steer away and uh, yeah then stick with it uh i so i absolutely love that uh p- people speaking of their dream in the past tense uh how do you move the dream back into the present and into the future that that's brilliant, mm, brilliant. i've i've got a uh, i've got a recommendation i i know what you can do with the next phase of your career <laughs> uh you need to start a new competition where they only go right <laughs> <laughs> it'll be brilliant wearing you guys, wearing fleece gym pants not right. spandex fleece, fleece gym, gym pants, pants and only turn right, right turns, turns. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be brilliant nobody's yeah. done it before uh <laughs> listen uh, olivia it's, it's been so great this is we so deeply appreciate you taking the time uh, yeah. to be a part of this uh to be able to share with our listeners i know that there's going to be some great feedback from uh, hearing you uh the success that you've had you've represented uh, canada well uh and uh, we're so certainly proud of, of uh, and I do recall, as soon as we talked about the dreads, I recall watching uh, <laughs> that race in which uh, you were part of, you did stand out because of, uh, of the uh, appearance. And, and it was just, it's really been uh, just wonderful to, to have a chance to have this conversation with you today. Thank you. It was a great time for me. Thanks. And thanks. I uh, like, I love sharing my stories and if it can help other people that, uh, to realize stuff and uh, bring some positive out. Oh, that's one of the reasons why I'm involved as a coach. I want to use that knowledge and try to share it because I, I like sport and what I did got such a positive impact on me that I, I'm very happy if I can share it and help other people. So thanks, thanks for the opportunity, guys. Yeah, absolutely, man. Your passion for it is clear. And again, thank you for coming on the show. To our listeners, we just want to uh, thank you for joining us today and listening in uh, on this great conversation. We remind you that our website, livingrichly.me, you're going to want to check it out. Uh, There you'll find show notes to today's episode. We're going to make sure to put all the ways you can get a hold uh, of uh, Olivier and how you can track his ongoing journey. Uh, You'll be able to do that there on the website. And make sure that you take a moment to like uh, and uh, and to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any other episodes. Uh, we mentioned uh, the book from Ben Bergeron. Ben's going to be a guest of ours this uh, in sometime in October. Want you to be able to take a chance to listen in on that episode. Uh, but you may have somebody in your network that's a aspiring athlete who is uh, maybe somebody who is dreaming of a podium one day. What a great episode that you could share out and maybe inspire them a little. Uh, and we'll certainly make sure to have that opportunity where you can even connect and talk to people like Olivia. I uh, want to encourage as well, Instagram, we are pushing it hard right now because we are putting out so many 
uh, shorts, uh, reels, uh, one-minute clips that you can uh, just digest, uh, digest so much of the information that we're providing on each episode. want you to uh, just connect to us uh, on that social media platform as well. Yeah, those, uh, those short, that short-form content. Think of it as micro-nutrition for the soul that can keep you going. Uh, last thing we would say, uh, listen, we, could, we heard about the power of coaching and the influence of coaching in your life at EVA, but if you're looking, if you're listening and you'd like some help on your uh, living your best life journey, then uh, please reach out to us. We do have uh, that available to you both in one-to-one and group format, uh, and uh, we encourage you to avail yourself of it. Thanks so much for listening in, and uh, we hope you'll join us again next week.